Judd. Will you join me in prayer again, please? Heavenly Father, we open your word. Father, that word inspired by the Holy Spirit and preserved through the ages for us. Father, we humbly ask that we would allow that same Holy Spirit to touch our hearts. In your son's precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. We're going to be in Psalm 146 today. Now, if you're new to your Bible, if you're new to your Scripture, that's not an issue at all. If you let your Bible fall almost open in the center, chances are you're going to hit one of the Psalms. And we're going to be toward the end of the book, almost to Proverbs, but not quite. We're going to be in Psalm 146. So if you would turn there in your Bibles, or if you have it electronically, whatever means by which you can be there, we're going to take a look at that. As we look at this, I want us to think for a moment about something that maybe we don't think about a lot. Have you ever wondered why it is we like to brag about things? Now, it's getting close to football time in Tennessee, okay? And all it takes is three or four guys together to begin talking about football. And amazingly enough, not everybody in this area is a Tennessee fan. Nothing? Okay. But, but what you'll notice is that when you get in that conversation about football, people will begin to brag and they'll begin to talk about how their team is better and, and why it's better. And it's not just football, folks. We, we do the same with, with recipes. We do the same with jokes. We do the same with our clothing. When we get something that we like, when we think it has value, we want to tell other people about it. We kind of kind of brag on it. Okay? You, I mean, you ought to be around me and my grandsons, especially my grandson Ethan, when we get to talking about baseball. He's got this strange idea that the Braves are a really good franchise. And I keep telling him the best in baseball is the St. Louis Cardinals, okay? Bo Henley, where are you when I need you? But you see, the reason that we do this, believe it or not, is that it is built within us to give praise to other things. We were made that way by our Heavenly Father. He formed us and molded us in His image. And while an image is, is not the exact thing, it reflects Him and it reflects a genuine ideal and He created in us when He formed us a desire to praise Him. Uh, Isaiah chapter 43 verse 21 says, The people I formed for myself will declare my praise. We are designed to to praise Him. And there are words that are interchangeable, I think, when we think about it, and that is praise and worship and serve. We're designed. God, when He created Adam and Eve in the garden, they were designed and they were created to serve Him, to walk with Him, to praise Him, and to, to make much of this Creator God of the universe. He designed it that way. He wants us to acknowledge his creative ability. He wants us to acknowledge His majesty, His justice, His love, His mercy, and His grace. Praise comes naturally for us, and by God's design, it should be directed to Him. Now, wait a minute. You're saying, are you saying we should never brag on the Braves or brag on the Vols or or brag on our favorite team, or brag on our favorite recipe. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is our praise should be first and foremost focused upon Him. And it should be consistent and it should be regular. Now, you, you might ask as you begin to think about this, well, is our God so vainglorious? Is He so weak that He needs us to praise Him? Is His ego so shallow that He needs our praise? And again, not at all. That's, that's not 
what, what I'm saying, and that's not what this Scripture teaches us. In fact, it is quite the opposite, and that's what I want us to see this morning. It is for our own good that we should praise our Heavenly Father. It is for our benefit that we do this. Why? Well, when we're focusing upon the greatness and the majesty of our Heavenly Father and His King, His Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, when we're focusing on them, we aren't focusing on ourselves. We're not focusing on our job. We're not focusing on pettiness. We're not focusing on all the different things that pull us away from God's design to praise Him. So when we're praising Him, we're focusing upon Him. And when we're focusing on Him, we're focusing upon all that is good in His creation. Our lives will be so much better our reward in heaven will be greater if we understand this basic reason why we should praise Him. And that's why the Holy Spirit gave us Psalm 146, is so that we can understand this better. So let's, let's take some time now to dig in to Scripture. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 146. Hallelujah! My soul praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to my God as long as I live. Well, let's look at that very first word. We sang it several times this morning. We hear it a lot, but let's understand what the word hallelujah really is. The word, the, the Hebrew word hallel means to praise. Okay? It means to praise. There are a number of psalms in the book of Psalms that are specifically known as Hallel Psalms. Probably the most famous of which that we may not be aware of are Psalms 113 through 118, which are an integral part of the Jewish Passover celebration, the Passover meal. They sing those psalms every year. Good observant Jews sing those psalms because they are a praise to the time when God rescued them out of Egypt. They are praise songs. Hallel means to praise. The U is a little connector there that basically means to or toward. And then we get to the latter part of the word, the Yah. Well, that, that's almost too obvious, isn't it? The Hebrew name for God was Yahweh. And they shortened it up here. Hallelujah literally in Hebrew means praise be to God. When we say hallelujah, we should say it understanding that what it means is praise be to our God. Now Psalm 146 through 150, these last five psalms, all begin and all end with the word hallelujah. Five psalms at the end that the Holy Spirit has reserved for us begin and end with the word hallelujah. Now, something that you may know and you may not know about the Hebrew language is they don't have suffixes that give ascending degrees of emphasis. In other words, in Hebrew, you can't say short, shorter, and shortest, or big, bigger, and biggest, or fast, faster, and fastest. Those suffixes don't end. What they do is they repeat They'll repeat the same word, or they'll repeat the same idea multiple ways to show emphasis. Jesus said, truly, truly. Folks, when Jesus in Scripture says, truly, truly, we better pay attention. And here in the latter part of this book of Psalms, we see five psalms at the end that begin and end with the word, hallelujah, praise be to God. Do you think? that the Holy Spirit was trying to communicate something to us through this emphasis on praise be to the God of the universe. I think so. Five of them. Now, let's look back at these, these first two verses. Four times in these two verses is the Lord God of the universe mentioned. The author is reinforcing with us that our lives must be focused on Him and all else becomes sec secondary. It says here, I will praise the Lord part of my life. Is that what it says? 
No, it says all. How much is all? It's all, isn't it? I will praise Him all of my life. He is to occupy our minds. He is to occupy our very beings. Paul put it this way in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He said, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of the Lord, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now get this. This is your true worship. This is your true praise to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He goes on, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. When we focus upon God, when we focus upon praising Him, we're trying our best to do what Paul is advising us here, and that is to make our lives a living sacrifice and to focus our minds on Him and take captive every thought and pass it through the filter of this God of the universe so that we can understand where He wants us to go and what He wants us to do. Our worship cannot be complete. Our minds cannot be renewed. And our resulting sanctification cannot be accomplished absent a mindset of praising God every opportunity that we have. It would be, I don't know that I could ever overemphasize what the Holy Spirit is communicating to us through this understanding. You know, being a follower of Christ is not something that we put on like an old coat to see us through bad weather. Being a follower of Christ is not something that we put on on Sunday mornings and we wear it to church and then when we get home we take it off not to be taken up again until we go back to church the next Sunday. That's not what a life in Christ is all about. A life in Christ is a focus upon Him, a focus upon praising Him. Jesus should be our life. He should be our hope when we feel hopeless. He should be our comfort when we are afraid. He should be our strength when we feel weak. Dee and I have got some good friends up in the St. Louis area. David and Tracy, and David's been fighting cancer now for two years. And we text and talk back and forth, and I'm always amazed at David and Tracy's focus upon Jesus Christ. And their focus through all that they've been through, all of this hurt, all of this sense of helplessness, all of this time that they've been fighting this, their focus is on Jesus Christ and in pleasing Him. Praising Him, even when we don't feel like it, brings our minds back to all that He is to us and for us. Why praise Jesus? Why praise God? Because the alternative is useless. Look at what the psalmist tells us in the next couple of verses. He's saying we don't need to praise these guys. Look, look at verses 3 and 4. Do not trust in nobles, in a son of man who cannot save. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the ground. On that day, his plans die. Now, the psalmist is using a contrasting method. He's told us that, that we should be praising Jesus Christ, that we should be praising the God of the universe. Now he's telling us what we shouldn't be praising. Look, look at what he says here. He says, do not trust in nobles. Well, what does that mean for us today? I, I, don't, I don't know any nobles. I know some people of noble character, but I don't know any nobles. So, so what's he talking about? What's that mean for us? Well, I think it means it represents anything earthly that we view as having any kind of authority over us. Th this can include uh, the government authorities. This can include where we work and the people that we work for. Uh, those that we may consider to be on a higher social level than us. It's really anyone to whom we may give authority in our lives. And don't ever forget probably the biggest authority in each of our lives, if we are not careful, and that is our own ego, our own sense of who we are, our own sense of right and wrong. 
Y'all realize that when we look at other people and we judge other people, we are giving authority to our ego. We're giving authority to ourselves. You ever notice that we can always meet our own standards? You ever notice that? We can always meet our own standards. But he says, do not trust in nobles. And, and this, this, he talks about here, a son of man. Now don't confuse that with Jesus' term that he used for himself, the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the Messiah. A Son of Man is just any one of us. So he's saying here, don't place our praise, don't be praising just ordinary people. Don't be praising an, an earthly, finite, individual or system of thought. Again, not in a casual sort of way, but where we begin well, I think it's important here that we look at two phrases here. It says, do not trust has to be coupled with cannot save. That's what he's talking about here. We cannot put our trust in something that cannot save us. Now, I understand the people that we work for, governmental authorities, can have a great influence over our lives, and they are due respect. I'm not telling you to rebel. Don't, don't, don't go to work tomorrow and say that I heard yesterday, I'm not supposed to give you any respect. That's not, not what we're saying. But what we're saying is, don't try to place a saving trust in a mere mortal, a mere mortal way of thought, a mere mortal way of doing things. Yes, they can have great influence, but they are just as we are. Mortal, they return to the ground, their plans their schemes, all of what they do winds up in the ground with them. Do not trust in nobles because they cannot save you. There's only one person that can save you, and that is Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we need to understand just how great a statement that is and how praiseworthy it is to know that He can. All these influences that we have, everything that we see, we hear people talk about different religions. You, you all know that, 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 and you've probably read this, that Buddhists cannot point to a Buddha that is alive. The, 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 the burial place of Buddha is readily available to visit. Muhammad is dead. All of these other worldly systems of religion are dead. Only we celebrate and worship a living God, Jesus Christ. We cannot put our trust in things that are no greater than we are. Now, the psalmist then talks about some positive reasons our praise should ring out for our Creator God. Should we praise God? We better believe that we should. Look at verses 5 through 10. Happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects resident aliens and helps the fatherless and the widow, but He frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Zion, your God, reigns for all generations. Hallelujah. Now, the psalmist gets to the heart of the matter here. Gives us some reasons why our praise should ring out for our Heavenly Father day and night. And the first one that he says... Again, we may have a question about, he talks about the God of Jacob. Now, now, why does he refer to the God of Jacob? I mean, what does the God of Jacob, one of the patriarchs of the, the nation of Israel, one of the Hebrew fathers, what does that matter to a bunch of Gentiles 3,000 years later? I mean, really, we read about Jacob, but we don't really know that much about him other than what Scripture tells us. Why does the psalmist refer to God? He could refer to him in so many ways. Why does he refer to him here as the God of Jacob? Well, here's why I think. 
That's because he wants the readers then and he wants us to understand now that this God is a God that keeps his promises. He's describing us and reminding us about God who made a covenant with Abraham, then renewed it with Abraham's son Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob, this God of Jacob. He made a covenant with them knowing that they could not keep up their end of the covenant. Read about it sometime. Read about how God passed among the sacrifice that was made for the covenant by himself, and Abraham just watched because God knew that Abraham couldn't keep it. But God knew that no matter what, he would keep his word. That's the kind of God that we should praise. A God that keeps his word. He always keeps his word. We are under a new covenant the covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ took on our sin on the cross and He died on our behalf so that we could be seen through Him in God's eyes. Only He could do that. And why is it important that we talk about a God that keeps His Word? I don't know about you, but when I read John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have eternal life. I am so glad that God is a God that keeps His Word because He makes us a promise there that if we believe in Him, we shall have eternal life. He also tells us in Romans 10.13 that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Aren't you glad that He's going to keep that promise? Would you want to give praise to a God that doesn't keep His promises? That's why we should praise, folks. We praise a God, this God of Jacob. Even if we stopped right here, there would be enough reason to praise God because He's one that keeps His promises. His justice, His mercy, His grace are assured because He keeps His word. Then it talks about he, he's the maker of heaven and earth. The maker of heaven and earth. Y'all, y'all follow any of the things that go on with, with uh, stuff uh, having to do with the space program or anything like that? Are y'all familiar with the James Webb Telescope? It's a big telescope up in orbit about the earth. It was named after the first director of the uh, NASA program, James Webb. It's kind of like the Hubble Telescope that's been around for years on steroids. This thing can see in places the Hubble could only squint at, okay? Astronomers tell us through the James Webb Telescope that they have discovered 200 billion, with a B, galaxies in the observable universe. The observable universe, there are 200 billion galaxies. In each one of those galaxies, it is estimated there are 100 billion stars. Now, for you mathematicians, that is 2 times 10 raised to the 22nd power stars. And that's just in what we can see. And this God created all of it. And not only did He create it, He knows the names of the stars. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26, Psalm 147, point, 147 verse 4, He knows all of those 2 times 10 to the 22nd stars By name, He created them. This is why we praise. This is the God we serve. This is the God that sent His Son to a rebellious people so that we might have a relationship with Him. Is that praiseworthy? I should hope so. He talks about justice for the exploited. God does not overlook the suffering of His people, nor does He overlook those that abuse His creation. Excuse me, I didn't know that would happen. God's going to do justice. If not apparent on this earth, then certainly when folks appear before Him in the next life. Revelation 20 tells us those who have rejected Him and His Son will be banished to a lake of fire for all eternity. And for those of us, who have repented of our sins and placed our faith and trust in Him, our own shortcomings, our own injustices, 
will be adjudged before Christ as described in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Not that we may lose our relationship or lose our salvation, but so that our reward in heaven may be properly accounted for. He will do justice. He will not overlook the exploited. So why should we praise? Because if our mind is upon Him, and I'm repeating what I said before, we, we look at that, we look at what I just said, and we worry a little bit about the fact that we are going to be judged ourselves as Christ followers. Our reward in heaven will be determined by our actions here on this earth. But folks, if we focus on praising Him, if we focus our life around Him, if we place our mind upon the God of Jacob, the God of creation, then we've got less time to focus on me, and we've got less time to focus on worldly systems of thought that infect us and that cause us to do injustice. Is that praiseworthy? I certainly think so. Talks about a God that feeds the hungry. God uses the body of Christ on this earth, the church, to help accomplish this. But let us not forget that man does not live by bread alone. This was Jesus speaking to Satan as he was tempted in the desert. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. And it's also through this same body of Christ, the church, that he spreads the word of that which and only which will satisfy the hunger of the soul. The good news of Jesus Christ. Is that praiseworthy? I think so. And along the same line, it talks about him freeing prisoners. Yes, he may free those incarcerated for whatever divine reason he may determine. And oftentimes he works through those that have believed in him and form his church to do so. But I think here the psalmist is also focusing on the same type of freedom as he was regarding feeding the hungry. We are born slaves to sin. We serve sin. We're born that way until we are freed by Jesus Christ when we repent of our sins and place our faith and trust in Him. So when He talks about freeing the prisoners, folks, He's talking about us. He frees us from the burden of sin when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Only He could do this. Folks, we are dead in our trespasses and in our sins. What does a dead individual do? Nothing. Nothing. Something that's dead cannot do anything for itself. But God pursued us in our rebellion and created a way for us to be reconciled, to be made right with Him through Jesus Christ if we but confess and repent. And it continues. He talks about healing and raising up the oppressed, protecting the widow and the fatherless and the foreigner. And the clincher is here, He loves the righteous. This is a clear reference to those who, who in that day looked forward to the cross and in our day look backward to the cross, placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's through us, His church, and those who love Him and have His righteousness imputed to us. See, He made the one who did not know sin, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 That's what He did for us. Is this worthy of praise? Is it worthy of praise that God, when He looks at us, if we've repented of our sins and received Jesus as our Savior, is it not praiseworthy that when He looks at us, He doesn't see our sin anymore? He doesn't see our depravity. He doesn't see our bad thoughts. He sees Jesus Christ and His righteousness. Is this praiseworthy? I certainly think so. And what happens when we don't praise Him? What happens? Jesus said that the rocks would cry out in praise if we did not. There's always going to be somebody to praise Him. If we don't, it's not going to lessen His glory. It's not going to lessen His majesty. It's not going to lessen His praise. We just miss a blessing. We just miss a blessing. We are called as His followers to do good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, after that great passage that talks about how we're saved through faith 
according to God's grace and it having nothing to do of our own power, it tells us that the reason that we are saved is to carry out the good works that God has determined for each one of us to do and He determined this before the beginning of time. We have work to do. We have praise to give. And then the psalm ends as it began. Hallelujah. Praise be to the God of the universe. Is He praiseworthy? Is He worthy of worship? Is He worthy of serving? I think He is. But there's something that we need to remember. If we are not worshiping and serving Him, we are worshiping and serving someone else. There is no middle ground. We either worship and serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, or we worship something else. One of the more popular poets and songwriters of my generation is a guy by the name of Bob Dylan. Now, some of you younger folks may have heard about him, but I'd say a lot of you my age and either side of it know exactly who Bob Dylan is, okay? Dylan, I'm not sure, was a believer, but you know, sometimes God uses lost people and lost things to point us toward the sun. Listen to just one verse of something that Dylan wrote. He wrote a song called, Gotta Serve Somebody. Listen to this just one verse. You may be a construction worker working on a home, might be living in a mansion, you might live in a dome. You may own guns and you may even own tanks. You may be somebody's landlord, you may even own banks. But you're going to have to serve or praise or worship somebody. Yes, you're going to have to serve or praise or worship somebody. Now get this, well it may be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve and praise and worship somebody. Dylan nailed it. He may not have even realized that he was nailing it, but he did. Folks, we've got to serve somebody. We've got to give that praise that is natural for us to give to somebody. Who's that going to be in your life? Are you going to hang your star on some man-made system of thought? Are you going to hang your future on your own pitiful capabilities? I know we think we're pretty smart sometimes. But next to a God that knows the name of 10 to the 22nd power, 2 times 10 to the 22nd power stars, next to a God who's the only one that can save us, folks, we better think about how praise belongs. Now this morning, if you're here, and you've never repented of your sins, if you've never gone to Christ and said, Lord, I'm sorry for the life I've lived and the things I've done, and I'm going to place my faith and trust in you. If you've not done that, we're going to have a time of response here in a moment. And Pastor Jeff and I will be down here. I would encourage you to come talk to us. Let us pray with you. Let us work through that understanding that you need of salvation. Maybe you've done that. But maybe for whatever reason, you've never had the opportunity to tell the world you've done that through the ordinance of baptism. You see, baptism takes something that's a mystery, how we're regenerated and how we're new in Christ, and it gives us a picture because we're buried with Christ in the water and then raised out of that. And we tell the world we're going to follow Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to come and talk to us about that. Maybe... You've determined that this is the place that you need to plant your life with your family and be a part of a group of people that praise God for the right reasons and that love God for the right reasons. I don't know what may be on your hearts this morning, but if the Holy Spirit has touched your heart this morning, don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't think that there's going to be a better time. The best time is now. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask for the freedom of Your people to respond to the Holy Spirit. Father, give us wisdom in knowing, Lord, the right thing to do. Father, let that right thing be to respond to Your Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name.
Amen.